Welcome everyone. We will wait a minute while everyone joins the webinar. Again, welcome everyone. We are just waiting a moment uh, while all the participants make their way into the Zoom room and then we will get started. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. We are waiting a moment while everyone makes their way into the Zoom room and then we will begin our program. Again, welcome everyone. We're just waiting a moment while everyone makes their way into the Zoom room. And then we will start our program. Good morning, everyone. We are so excited that you are here. See those numbers continuing to climb. I see them slowing down. So we will go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining us this morning and welcome to Voices of Freedom, a webinar celebrating the launch of the California Community College's Rising Scholars Network. I am Dr. Aisha Lowe, Vice Chancellor of Educational Services and Support at the Chancellor's Office. We are thrilled today to officially launch the Rising Scholars Network, comprised of more than 50 community colleges that proudly serve formerly incarcerated students on campus and students currently in prison or jail. These colleges put into action our commitment to serving all students in the state of California and our belief that everyone, no matter their past, can succeed. In launching the Rising Scholars Network, uh, we are launching a network that seeks to ameliorate the impacts of incarceration on students' lives by providing funding and programs that support the success of our more than 12,000 incarcerated and formerly incarcerated students. The Rising Scholars Network works to elevate opportunities for individuals, families and communities impacted by mass incarceration by pairing high expectations with high support to build a generation of graduates and leaders in our community. And we are so excited to hear from some of those students today and to elevate their voices and their lived experiences. So before we begin uh, with our programming, a few housekeeping items. One, uh, if you would like to have live captioning if you look on the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should see a live transcript button uh, with a CC for closed captioning. Click that button and you'll be able to see the closed captioning. Also, we want to remind everyone that we will be answering questions using the Q&A function in Zoom. So enter your questions there. We also encourage you to use the Q&A function just to say hello and let us know who you are and bring us greetings this morning. So we have an exciting hour this morning. Uh, we are gonna kick off uh, with greetings from our chancellor, Chancellor Elo Ortiz Oakley, and the celebrated poet and writer, Reginald Dwayne Betts. We will then come to the highlight of this event, which is an open conversation featuring three of our rising scholar students. We will conclude with the Campaign for College Opportunity sharing their new report on formerly incarcerated students just released yesterday. So with that, I'm going to invite our chancellor, Chancellor Oakley, to kick us off. All right, uh, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lowe, for bringing us all together. And I just am um, very excited to, to join you all today and to see the 
hundreds and hundreds of people who have joined us to talk about this very important topic and to celebrate um, this opportunity to continue to serve um, every student in California. Um, so many of you who are joining us, uh, I know we have college faculty, we have staff, we have administrators, um, and very importantly, we have students, students joining us today. Um, and I know we also have uh, members of the legislative staff. We have uh, folks from the California Department of Corrections and Re Rehabilitation, private funders and the media. So welcome everyone uh, to this webinar. You know, we have more than uh, 50 colleges that form the Rising Scholars Network. Some serve students in prison or in jail. Some have programs on campus for formerly incarcerated students and some do both. Uh, most of our community colleges uh, have been doing this work for less than five years, driven by some really dedicated faculty, staff, and administrators, and students. Uh, the California Community College's Chancellor's Office uh, started using the name Rising Scholars Network in late 2019, and many colleges have a local program name that they use in addition to Rising Scholars. So what are we doing? We're embracing students who have historically been left behind, um, telling them that they have a place in our society, that they're not forgotten, and that we will do everything we can to help them achieve their dreams. For many years, people who have been, uh, who, who were involved with the criminal justice system were told that um, they weren't much, worth much. Uh, maybe uh, they got a GED. Uh, young people, overwhelmingly students of color, were pushed out of school and sent down the school to prison pipeline. College was barely available in the prison system, and those who had been involved with the criminal justice system were invisible on our college campuses. As a state and as a public higher education system, we reject this past and embrace this excluded generation of students not as a side project, but as a fundamental uh, part of the California Community College mission and certainly a part of the vision for success and an important part of our call to action. I also wanna take this moment to thank uh, several members of the administration and um, the legislature, um, uh, beginning with uh, Governor Brown and now Governor Newsom their administrations have put an emphasis on serving uh, current and formerly incarcerated individuals, as well as Assembly Member McCarty and Senator Skinner and many others in the legislature. So I, I do wanna thank them for making this possible. Um, this is California innovation at its best. Mass incarceration has denied social mobility to millions and destroyed communities, particularly communities of color. Um, and that impact has been felt and we, we are witnessing the impact uh, today. The California Community Colleges are stepping up to play a part in remedying these wrongs. Uh, we couldn't do this without the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. They control access to, to the students. Um, and I know that we place sometimes an unwelcome burden on their staff. So I wanna thank them for allowing us in and helping us serve these students. And of course, if, if you all get a chance, please thank Secretary Kathleen Allison and the CDCR leadership and staff in the Division of Adult Institutions and the Division of Rehabilitative Programs, especially Director Brent, Brent Chody and Superintendent Shannon Swain. Uh, they've, they've been breaking down silos and making this all possible. Um, I also wanna thank uh, the staff at Pelican Bay Prison especially Warden Robertson and Principal Joe Cummings for working with our office and the College of the Redwoods to make it possible for the students who are with us today to participate. So prior to 2015, California law prohibited community colleges from collecting FDS for face-to-face -face courses in prison. Since 2015, face-to-face -face community college students in prison have increased from zero to more than 6,000, all on associate degree for transfer or other transfer pathways. Another 6,000 students take community college correspondence courses, usually because they can't access face-to-face -face instruction. 
every prison in California has a partnership with one, of, one or more of our colleges. 10% of the men and women in prison in California are enrolled in a community college. Great news. And we need to continue to grow that. The number of formerly incarcerated students on campus is, is still unknown, um, but we know it's more than a thousand and we're gonna continue to work on our MIS data uh, to try and capture that information. Um, recently, the legislature allocated 5 million one time uh, back in 2018, thanks largely to the efforts of folks like President uh, Keith Curry at Compton College, so thank you, Keith. 44 colleges received grants of about $113,000 each, and the money has been spent or will be spent by the end of December of this year. Two legislative efforts are currently pending, and I know Vice Chancellor David O'Brien is aware of both uh, and keeping us abreast. They are a bill to create and fund the Rising Scholars Network. The bill would become operative only if funding were allocated, which may or may not happen this year, but we're very hopeful. A bill to amend the penal code to require CDCR to work with community colleges and CSU and UC and other nonprofit regionally accredited colleges and universities is also working its way through. The bill would prohibit CDCR from replacing local colleges with for-profit distance education providers. And we all know why that's so important. The community colleges and our colleagues uh, provide much greater value to all of our students uh, especially those who are justice involved. Rising Scholar students are currently building a statewide caucus in the Student Senate for the California Community Colleges. So I have to, as always, commend the SSCCC's leadership. And Rising Scholar students and programs across the state are partnering with Project Rebound in the CSU and underground scholars in the University of California to strengthen transfer pathways to students who have been involved with the justice system. We call our students students. They may be incarcerated or formally incarcerated, but make no mistake, they are students first. Correction staff often use the terms inmate, offender, or ex-offender, but we try to keep the, those words out of the education space because they're all here to improve their lives and that's what our mission is really all about. So I wanna thank you all for joining us. I know you've got a lot in front of you on this agenda uh, and uh, I want to get out of the way and let you do uh, the work that you came here to do and to celebrate this Rising Scholars Network. So thank you. Thank you all for your commitment to these students. This is such an important initiative, not just um, uh, for what you're doing for the current and formerly incarcerated, but for what you're doing for the state of California and what you're doing uh, to end systemic racism throughout the country. So thank you. And I'll turn it back over to Vice Chancellor Lowe. Thank you very much, Chancellor Oakley. We appreciate your presence, your words, and your commitment to this important work. Thank you. I am now honored to introduce Reginald Dwayne Betts, poet and lawyer. Mr. Betts is the director of the Million Book Project, an initiative out of Yale University Law School's Justice Collaboratory, which seeks to radically transform access to literature in prison. For more than 20 years, he has used his poetry and essays to explore the world of prison and the effects of violence and incarceration on American society. The author of a memoir and three collections of poetry, uh, Mr. Betts' last collection of poetry, Felon, explores the post-incarceration experience and lingering consequences of a criminal record. In 2019, Mr. Betts won the National Magazine Award in the Essays and Criticism category for his New York Times Magazine essay that chronicles his journey from prison to becoming a licensed attorney. He is a 2018 Guggenheim Fellow and a 2018 Emerson Fellow at New America and holds a JD from Yale Law School. Please welcome uh, Dwayne as he prefers to be called. And thank you so much, Dwayne, for joining us. Confession. At 2 a.m. without enough spirit spilling into my liver to know enough to call my tongue to silence. My youngest, 
learned of the why of the years I spent inside a box. A spell, a kind of incantation I was under. Not whiskey, but history. As a teenager, I robbed a man. I tell him this months before he would drop bucket after bucket on opposing players. The entire B draggle bunch five and six, and he leaping as if every layup erases something. That's how I saw it. My screaming, coaching, sweating presence recompense for the pen. My father has never seen me play ball as part of this. My oldest son knew, brought into this truth by a stranger. Tell me we aren't running towards failure, is what I want to ask my boys. But it is two in the AM. The oldest has gone off the dream in the comfort of his room. The youngest, despite him seeming more lucid than me, just reflects cartoons back from his eyes. So when he tells me, Daddy, it's okay. I know what's happening is some scraggling angel lost from his pack finding a way to fulfill his duty. Lending words to this kid who crawls into my arms wanting more than the stories of my past. The sleep that he fought while I held court at a bar with men who knew that when the drinking was over, the drinking wouldn't make the stories we brought home any easier, any easier to tell. Now, um, thank you guys for having me. And uh, Vice Chancellor Lowe, I appreciate the introduction. I'll just say a few things. I went to prison when I was 16 for carjacking a man. This was 1996 and there were no college programs in Virginia. I mean, in fact, I remember waiting to be sentenced, hearing them talk on the radio about whether or not people in prison should have access to Pell Grants. And I remember people in my community, because this was Black radio. This wasn't even like, um, you know, like the NPRs and public radio. No, this was Black FM morning radio. The issue had been important. The word mass incarceration didn't exist. And the callers to a person all said that, no, locked up in a cell, you shouldn't have access to a story. You shouldn't have access to an education that would give you another story. I did eight and a half years in prison, told myself the one thing I was gonna do is get an education. I remember coming home, I remember coming home and not knowing what the word semester meant. I went to the University of Maryland and I tried to enroll. I came home in March. I went to Maryland in April because I thought the first thing I was going to do is get a degree. The man said, uh, we already admitted students for the class of 2008 or some shit. And I was like, that's cool because I want to be in the class of today. I didn't graduate from high school, so I didn't even understand what it meant to be a part of a graduating class. Now, he was trying to understand how I could be in my 20s, wanting to attend college and not know what the fuck the word semester meant. And I said, look, I planned on not admitting that I'd been to prison because I had a, a reputation that I thought I had to uphold. You know, students aren't convicts. They ain't felons. But I was fucked up because he was looking at me like I was crazy. And I knew that he was looking at me like I was crazy because he was seeing my ignorance. And I wasn't going to be afraid of this dude. I did eight and a half years in prison. My friends were in prison. And I wasn't going to run from that history. So I said, look, man, I just came home from prison. And he looked at me. And instead of dismissing me, he said, um, well, we already chose the students for this class. You know, every four years is a, a class. We already chose these students. And anyway, you know, you're in the middle of a semester. Ah, a semester is like probably in high school you had quarters. Well, college is two semesters and we're in the middle of the second semester. So you couldn't start today, even if you wanted. But you know what you should do? 
you should go to community college. And I said, in my head, what the fuck is a community college? <laughs> Cause I was like, I'm in the community. You know, this is a college. I mean, what is he trying to send me back to prison? And he said, no, no, it's like a two year school. You know, you go there and you prove yourself as a student. You seem pretty smart. Then I start liking him again. <laughs> He's like, you seem pretty smart. So you go to the two year college and uh, you spend a year there and then you transfer here. Now look, I did that. I went to the community college. I took a, I, I don't know. I think I, gra I graduated with like a, a insane number of credits, but I guess I took, I used to know this by heart. Oh man, whatever it was, however many classes I took, I had like 29 A's and one C. Graduated, went to the University of Maryland. I should tell y'all this and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna close up. But I got a full tuition scholarship to Howard University. And I went there feeling like new money, feeling like I'm about to be a graduate of Howard University. And they slid me a piece of paper that had a box on it, called the lady into the room, said, let me, let, let me talk to you in this room. It was me, my mentor, and a woman. And I said, look, that box there, I got a, I got a, you know? She was like, nah, I don't know. I was like, you know, the, the box. She was like, can you just explain what's going on? I was like, well, look, man, when I was 16, I carjacked somebody, got like three felonies, you know. I wrote about it in an essay. Did you read it? She hadn't read the essay because I was guaranteed admission with a full tuition scholarship. I tried to sign a contract real quick. She snatched it from up under me. And like that, the scholarship disappeared. And I was frustrated. I was thinking that my chance of becoming something in this world had disappeared that fast. But then I got admitted into the University of Maryland, never full tuition scholarship. And two years later, I graduated from Maryland and I was the commencement speaker. I stood up in front of the crowd and I was like, a dozen years ago, I stood in front of the Honorable Judge Bach and he sentenced me to nine years in prison. Now, it was like 5,000 people in, a, in, a, in an audience. You know, it was like 5,000 graduates, family members. It was packed. The white folks on the front row was like, did he just say he was in prison? Nah, he didn't say that. And I was like, yes, I was in prison. And it devastated him. And then they clapped. And the applause was thunderous, right? And the story I'm telling you is that I had to learn how not to run away from any of it. My son had to learn about my crimes. But education guaranteed that I would have another story to tell my child. And so for everybody who's a student right now inside a penitentiary or a jail or any place of confinement, the thing I want you to know is that we build our lives on stories. You don't have to run from the stories you already own to build stories that sound better. My kid knows I was in prison, but my kid knows that he sees me every day. He knows that I'm in a community. He knows that I collected a bunch of college degrees that I don't even show folks. I'm gonna show y'all this one before I stop talking just cause it's sitting on my floor. This shit ain't even written in English. I have no idea what it says, but I know this is my degree from Yale Law School. And what that means is I could walk into any room I want and act the same way I acted before I got that degree. Because the degree is the substance of the narrative I built around myself that says that I am more than the crime I committed. And I show that by what I do every day. So I applaud everybody that's here. I applaud the Community College Network. I thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak. And, um, and I hope that you guys can find ways to check out the Million Book Project and see how I'm trying to continue to build the foundation for others that I was able to build for myself through reading, through literature, and through a desire to keep learning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dwayne. Thank you for sharing your experiences. Thank you for sharing your work. Uh, we are honored to have you and honored that you joined us to, to help to shed a light on our very real students, right, that are often behind mass numbers. So thank you so much for that. Well, I am equally honored to introduce three of our Rising Scholar students today. Uh, we have with us today Nohi Alani Kasperson, a student at Cypress College, Isaac Gonzalez, a student at East Los Angeles College, and Tabidi Wilson, 
a student at College of the Redwoods. So the California Community Colleges strive to be student-centered, and that means listening to our students, having the humility to stop, to listen, knowing that it is our job to give our students what they need, and knowing that all of our students can achieve at high levels and fulfill their dreams. Well, thank you so much scholars for being with us today. So to begin our time with each other, I'm going to ask each of our students to tell us about themselves and what brought them to community college. So Novi Alani, we will start with you. Can you tell us about yourself and how you came to community college? Sure. Um... So I am a Kanakamo Oli woman. I'm born and raised in Hilo, Hawaii, where uh, ancestral trauma and multi-generational trauma is just a thing, you know? Um, it, it was broken raising the broken and children raising the children. And there's a lot of times where we just didn't have the skills, but we were still doing our best, you know? And that's what I get to realize. And so, um, from a young age, I, after therapy, right, and talking to others, um, I recognized that uh, going to jail and going to prison was looked at as almost a badge of honor in my family. It was a rite of passage. It was something that the strong guys got to do, and I wanted to be the strong guy as an adolescent, you know, and so uh, for me, um, following in my family's footsteps, and, and remembering things like it was uh, the day when we would go visit my father in prison from little, I remember it being a positive experience. I had my mom's attention all day. We got new clothes. We got to go out to eat. There were things that made that a significant moment for me. So um, to just kind of come forward a little bit, uh, jail and prison was a majority of my adolescence, starting with the YA program. I think I was 15. Um, and then uh, eventually I got to big girls jail, right? And um, in Hawaii, they have state jail and prison. They don't have federal. So when it's time to do a federal term, you come and give the choice of California, Arizona, Washington. Um, I was given the choice of California because my father was out here. And so that's how I ended up in California. Um, it was in and out of jail. It was in and out of treatment. It was uh, just the same cycle until in treatment one day, one of my supervisors said, you'd be a great helper. You know, you're such a healer. Why wouldn't you apply yourself for this? And really it took someone that believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. I didn't even know how, you know? And so um, she took me by the hand and we registered for school and, uh, that's where I really found hope was at the community college. I walked in feeling uncomfortable and out of place and too old. And I walked out feeling hopeful and empowered and, and strong again, authentically and unapologetically me. And so I, I started at Cypress College on the journey of becoming a addiction specialist and then a case manager. Uh, I still work in that treatment center that helped uh, me today. And um, I'm still on the journey of becoming a healer. And so thank you for having me. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for sharing your, your story. I think it's so important to note from your story and even thinking of Dwayne's story, how one person, right? One person had to take the time, right? To speak life, to see the potential uh, to help change the trajectory of an entire life. So that's so powerful. Thank you for sharing that. All right, so next, uh, I'm going to continue with our students. Uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, your story with us. And we're going to continue with the rest of our students and hearing from them. Uh, so Tabidi, I'm going to call on you now. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And of course, we, we want to thank uh, Warden Robertson and Principal Cummings we're getting thing, every, everything set up so that you can be with us today. So Tabidi, tell us about yourself and what brought you to community college. Well, uh, first I'd like to say, I appreciate uh, this opportunity for California Community Colleges and the Rise of Scholars Network and College of the Redwoods for choosing me to use my voice in this platform. Um, I'm 41 years old. I'm from San Diego, California, the Southeast section of San Diego, California. Um, which is predominantly black and brown, uh, poverty-stricken, crime-ridden. 
I was raised by a single mother, divorced mother. Um, I'm one of four children. I have two older brothers who also been through the system. And I have a twin sister who went the other route and did, did well with her life. Um, graduated from college about 20 years ago and she's been doing, doing well since then. Uh, growing up, um, we didn't have much, but what we did have was a mother who, who really wanted the best for us. So she did everything she could with what she had. Um, she made sure that all of us could read and write before we started elementary school. So before I started kindergarten, I had a bit of a head start and that stayed with me throughout elementary school and in the junior high. But in the junior high, um, the pull of the streets became a little stronger than my uh, want for education. And I'll join gangs. And uh, that would eventually lead to my incarceration at the age of 19. Uh, when I first came to prison, prison wasn't really a place that was uh, conducive to learning as far as education. It wasn't really something that you saw. It was pretty much frowned upon. But uh, so it was a long journey for me to get to the point where I even felt comfortable with uh, enrolling in college. But fast forward a bit, I landed in Pelican Bay in 2015 after just finishing another shoe turn. And I had just found out that uh, I needed to do things differently. And I had a celly um, by the name of Larry Vickers who was already enrolled in college. And he used to just talk to me about it. And I already had my um, high school diploma. So I knew that I could go to college. I just had never thought about it. But through interacting with him and seeing his progress, it just made me want to give it a shot myself. So College of the Red was at Kansas Institution. The opportunity presented itself and uh, I decided to take advantage of it. And initially I was probably more nervous than the teachers. Uh, I didn't really know what to expect, but coming into the classroom environment, it was just uh, welcoming. It felt like a, one of the first like real human experiences I had during this time incarcerated. The teachers came with, a, with open minds. They really wanted to give us an opportunity to learn. So they, they allowed us to, to, to ask questions and debate and figure things out as we went along. And uh, it just made the whole environment uh, smoother. Uh, prison, as, prison in of itself became different uh, with, these, with these programs uh, landing in this institution. When I first came to prison, you wouldn't see um, Blacks and Mexicans or whites walking the yard and talking about anything. If you saw that, it was pretty much something's probably gonna happen. So with college, like these racial lines was being crossed. I mean, we, we gotta work with each other. We, we're trying to figure things out, like maybe a statistics problem or uh, debating some, some term, something in the philosophy class. So we had to start working with each other. And working with each other brought us to getting to know each other in ways that we had never done before. And um, this began to translate to these yards as well. So where you would usually see everybody just separated off into their own sections, you might see individuals walking lots with each other. And most people would be wondering, like, what's going on? What are they talking about? They're just talking about what happened in class last night or what happened, what, what we expect to go through in class this day. But uh, yeah, community college, my, 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 my interest in community college, it was really like, it landed on me more than me seeking it. But I'm proud of it and I'm glad that the opportunity presented itself. That is awesome to be. Thank you for sharing. Uh, we just honor you sharing your experience. Uh, we are proud of you and the work that you're doing. Um, and just awesome to hear how our community colleges, the presence of education, not just breaking down barriers for our students, but literally breaking down barriers even within the prison culture. That is amazing to hear. So thank you for sharing that. So last but certainly not least, we want to hear from you, Isaac. A uh, same question, tell us about yourself and what brought you to community college. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Isaac Gonzalez and I'm a Chicano born and raised in East Los Angeles. I'm also a formerly incarcerated student currently attending East Los Angeles College. Uh, growing up in, um, in, in, in my home, it was very loving. You know, I, I don't ever recall going to sleep cold or hungry at night. 
you know, uh, growing up on Duncan Avenue, it was my piece of heaven on earth. You know, I had my friends, my family, but all that changed dramatically when gang culture was introduced to my home. My two eldest brothers were incarcerated and those were my heroes, my teachers, most of them my brothers, and I loved dearly. Without them, I became um, angry, frustrated, and I was lost trying to figure out the world on my own. So soon, um, the streets became my therapy. I joined the gang and I, I followed in my brother's footsteps. You know, that led me to going in and out of prison through a majority part of my life. Upon my last incarceration, I remember getting processed in Dallas County Jail. And I called um, my wife and I talked to my son and he asked me, uh, why did you do that, dad? As we hung up, I sat down and um, I began to ask the question, why do I continue to do what I do? And then my journey began. You know, I, I knew I needed help. And I needed to learn how to live. And um, while sitting in my jail cell, I dreamt of a better life. And um, I strongly believe education will save my life. Fortunately for my wife, Nancy Gonzalez, she always supports me in everything I do. I would request uh, reading material. I would request uh, uh, books on subjects as uh, military strategy, Chinese philosophy, self-help. And as I began to read, these books began to speak to me. I started coming across ideas and beliefs that I shared years ago. And that led me also to believe that I was onto something. And, then, and I began to dream of, of one day attending college. So upon my release, I, uh, I, I paroled and uh, I was out. And um, so I applied to East Los Angeles College and I was accepted. You know, when I first started, I was initially going to go for uh, addiction study certificates. You know, but, uh, but my friend, uh, Brittany Morton at Homeboy Industries, she suggested that I take, uh, that I go for an AA for transfer. And that's what I did. So here I am today. You know, and it's just been an amazing journey. You know, like today I, I love my life. I love everything that I do. You know, and uh, today I, I, I now know I have purpose and this purpose is gonna be fulfilled. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Isaac. Um, it, you That was a quotable right there. So all, all of those who are fans of Twitter, that is a quotable right there. Education will save a life. That is awesome. Thank you for that, Isaac. So this next question, scholars, is open to whomever wants to respond. So right now today in this virtual audience, we have faculty, we have educational leaders, community members, and representatives from the legislature. What is one thing you want them to know, uh, whether it's about your experiences, your aspirations, or your needs, or anything else that's on your heart and mind that you would want to share with this audience? So I open that up to all three of you. One thing you would want to share uh, with those in the audience. Um, I'll go first. I feel like uh, introducing the Rising Scholars Network, this dream, this this thing that we've talked about for the last few years, you know, it really is giving a, a home to homeless. It really is in the beginning and in the foundation of us. In, in our college educations, creating a form of solidarity that is so necessary. Um, I know uh, Chancellor Oakley brought it up a minute ago that there is the Underground Scholars Initiative if you're in the UC system, as well as Project Rebounds if you're in Cal States, but there was nothing for those of us who didn't reach education after we were released. There's that like middle area that we just really at the community college level didn't have a place to belong to. And so it, in having the Rising Scholars Network, like it really does, I think, put another level of connection from inside to outside also because they know where to look when they come home, you know? And I think it's just so valuable. Um, the caucus, the statewide caucus, like if not for this pandemic, we wouldn't be able to do all of these things. And, and I'm just so in awe today and so very grateful to be a part of all of it. If I could step in. Um, I just wanna say that uh, not only is education like essential for, for those of us incarcerated like myself towards our rehabilitation, these programs that we that 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 are being introduced into this uh, CDCR are necessary, along with 
uh, to go inside co coincide with the education like uh, we've, we've been doing a lot of work in here trying to trying to prepare ourselves for eventual reentry into society and uh, I know a lot of people like uh, you know you guys don't really deserve these opportunities you don't deserve um, um, to, to, to have this education and, and I would say maybe we don't but what I do believe is that the communities we come from deserve for when we do when we are released they deserve us to come back to a community that we that we took from and be able to give something back to it and i believe the only way we'll be able to do that is through education and through these programs that we've uh, that we that, that these rehabilitative programs that we participate in uh, without these programs or without this education i think i mean we're just going to get it's going to just be an ongoing cycle and if we really want to end this cycle just end this mass incarceration the key is more programs, more college programs, more um, programs. In this institution, my, in this institution, uh, it was created here in this institution in conjunction with with with, with outside help from um, Catherine Hope and. Uh, now that program is going national. Um, we're trying to change people's lives, but we, we really start from the side before you get out. So when you when you do get out, you, you're prepared. And I believe programs like that and, and ARC and, and college programs is, is, is essential to not only our well-being, but our community's well-being and our and our and our country's well-being as a whole. Because if we really want to make a, a, a change, if we really want to see things become better, it starts right here. Awesome. Thank you both. Isaac, do you want to jump in on this one? Yes. Um, uh, what, what I would like uh, people to know is uh, there's a stigma attached to being a gang member and a drug addict. You know, often uh, society dismisses, they dehumanize us. And um, I would like to say all, all the feelings that you feel, we feel them too. We laugh, we cry. At times we even sometimes hate, but most of all we love. We are human beings. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to each one of you. Uh, so last word uh, from each one of you as we're coming to the close of, of this part of our segments. Uh, now we just wanna hear from each one of you, what's next, right? What's on the horizon uh, for you as you continue uh, to build your life and to build your future? Uh, so we'll circle back around. We'll start with you, Isaac. Uh, then we'll go to, to BT and then we'll close with Nohi Alani. What's next, Isaac? Well, I have a big vision, have a, a big dream, you know, and it, and it all started in prison. You know, like when I would sit in my cell, I would just reflect on my life and, you know, and I, I began to dream, you know, and uh, like I mentioned earlier, I, I, when I first started, I was going to go after certificates and now I'm chasing degrees. You know, it's like a, about a year ago, I attended a college prep class at West Los Angeles College and upon my completion of that class, that program, um, when they introduced me, the lady who ran it uh, introduced me as future professor Isaac Gonzalez. And that resonated with me so much, it rang a bell, you know? And it's like, okay, I, I could see myself doing that. You know, I wanna get in the field of helping, uh, get into the business of helping people. That's what I wanna do. And then maybe become a professor then I maybe teach people how to help people, you know, and possibly write some books and, you know, be a part of change. Thank you. Um, to bounce off of what Isaac said, I believe education has given us reason to dream and not just dream, but believe these dreams are now attainable. Um, for me, I, the, the immediate is getting my A degree, which I should be able to get by the end of the fall semester 2021. Uh, then I, I plan on transferring to uh, Lancaster to pursue my bachelor's degree. And hopefully, in the future, being able to reenter society and uh, pursue a business degree, and, and possibly a master's degree in business. But uh, for me, education just gave me is it, just is just giving me so much. Like I know what I want to do with my life, and I'm I'm gaining the knowledge necessary to get to where I want to get. Um, and I just feel like we just got to keep going. 
Um, these programs is essential. And I just want to keep reiterating that, that we need to just keep going. We need to just keep pressing forward, getting bigger. I mean, we, we've grown since a lot, since I, since I first entered this program in, in 2017, 2016. And uh, I believe we're just going to keep continuing to grow some more. And I just, I just want to just keep on building. All right, no, Yolani, we will close with you. What's next? Um, so scripture says I will be a lamp to your feet, right? Not a spotlight to my future, but I'll get to know my next indicated step. As of right now, uh, we are getting to participate in Ensha next, another virtual, you know. Um, realistically, community college gave me hope. And if I can spend the rest of my life giving out hope, like that's what I want to do, what it shows up as, where it looks like, I do know one thing, education is a door opener. It's a special key for me to get into the places to help the people that need the help. And so uh, doctor something, I'm sure what it ends up being, we'll see, you know, um, I just never believed in myself. And, and if not landing at Cypress College on someone else's little gentle loving push I don't know where I'd be today and I owe my entire life to to this this these kind of moments I don't even know how to say that um so yeah school lots of more school uh preparing uh with Isaac I think we have paperwork later on today right and um really just listening to amazing mentors like Danny continue to lead us and in, in wherever it is that we are blessed enough to be so thank you everybody thank you thank you so much to Bidi. thank you Isaac thank you Nohi Alani your willingness to share today and your dedication to education and your own future inspires all of us to do even more to make sure these sort of opportunities are available for students across the state. So thank you so much. So coming up next, uh, we have joining us Danny Murillo and the Campaign for College Opportunity. So Danny is originally from Norfolk, Norwalk, excuse me, California. He graduated from Cerritos College and transferred to the University of California, Berkeley, where he co-founded the Underground Scholars Initiative, which is a student organization and support program dedicated to supporting formerly incarcerated and system impacted students. He was a media representative for the Prison Hunger Strike Solidarity Coalition, a coalition supporting the Short Corridor Collective which was a group of incarcerated men organizing a statewide prison hunger strike to end the practice of long-term solitary confinement. As the former program analyst at the Campaign for College Opportunity, an organization dedicated to ensuring all Californians have the opportunity to attend and succeed in college, Danny led efforts to increase awareness for the unique challenges facing currently and formerly incarcerated students in California's public higher education system. He is the primary author of the Campaign for College Opportunities latest report, The Possibility Report, From Prison to College Degrees in California. And currently, Danny is a graduate student in the Social and Cultural Analysis of Education program at California State University, Long Beach. Welcome, Danny. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Chancellor Lowe. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I also want to thank and acknowledge Chancellor Oakley and the California Community College Chancellor's Office and their efforts to support currently and formerly incarcerated students. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. It is an honor to be here today, to be here this morning and contribute to this event's theme, and that is uplifting the voices of currently and formerly incarcerated students. Um, it, it's, you know, I am a formerly incarcerated person and um, what Tabithi just shared about education changing the culture of a prison um, when I left Pelican Bay Shoe, um, I started seeing that. I was in an education program. It was a pre-release program in solitary confinement. And it was the first time where I was actually just having conversations with people that at one point I thought they were my enemies, right? And I was actually preparing food for them. I was cooking for them. I was sharing my books with them, something that I had never done. And I really think that that was because of education, right? It transformed our... Um, the space that we were in, 
right? And I have gone back to Pelican Bay Prison as a visitor three different times. And what I've seen on the prison yard um, is something that I never thought I would ever see in my life, right? And similar to Tabithi had shared, right? People, you know, Black, white, brown folks just walking around engaging in conversation about philosophical or psychological or sociological topics, right? And, and for me, um, I'm proud to have been played a part in trying to continue to um, create access for higher education for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people. I'm a graduate of Cerritos College, right? And, and Cerritos College for me was the first community coming home that really opened their arms and welcomed me and seen me as a human being, right? You know, my, my English professor, Dr. Claude Berryman, my mentor, Mando Soto, my academic advisor, Veronica Carrera, my English tutor, Damien Cagliari, all of these folks, right, really took an interest and invested in me and wanting to see me succeed. And so for me, the community, the community college holds a very special place in my heart. Thank you. So this morning, I am here to officially introduce the possibility report from prison to college degrees in California. This includes descriptive, this includes descriptive demographics on California's incarcerated people and parole population, a landscape analysis of federal and state policies detailing the environment in which higher education is made accessible to incarcerated and formerly incarcerated individuals, followed by what I believe to be the most critical part of the report, the voices of formerly incarcerated students from all three segments of California's public higher education system, describing the barriers and opportunities they encounter as they transition from incarceration into higher education. Finally, the report includes a series of recommendations for campuses and California to dismantle post-incarceration barriers and to create more opportunities for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated students to improve their lives, contribute to California's economic health and public safety. Last summer, the Campaign for College Opportunity hosted three virtual focus groups with 29 students representing a cross-section of California's community colleges, Cal State University, and University of California campuses. The focus group participants were diverse in terms of gender, race, ethnicity, and they had an array of experiences accessing and succeeding in higher education. The focus groups included individuals who were enrolled in a college program while incarcerated and continued their education upon release as well as participants who were enrolled only after the release from jail or prison. Their academic interests varied from certificate degrees, associates in arts and science, associate degrees for transfer, bachelors, masters, PhDs, and law degrees. Although our focus group participants had a diverse set of life experiences, five common themes emerged from all three focus groups. One, parole and probation. Two, housing. Three, employment four, targeted support, and five, career transition. Next slide, please. The parole and probation systems in California do not prioritize higher education and often present barriers that keep formerly incarcerated students from achieving their educational goals. There is no centralized policy guidance on managing and supporting formerly incarcerated students on probation and parole. For the most part, participants in the focus group described probation and parole officers as unsupportive of their educational and aspirational goals. Next slide, please. Requirements to access housing or parole requirements leave students with unstable living situations, creating an environment unconducive to going or staying in college. Many students shared that transitional housing conditions require that an individual is not a full-time student or they could not apply for affordable housing because they had an ankle monitor and or felony convictions. Many of the focus group participants shared that they had lived in vehicles during their educational journeys and were often homeless. Next slide, please. Formerly incarcerated students straddled two employment problems, finding work with a conviction history and balancing the need to work while attending school. The need to work poses, possess, poses severe issues for formerly incarcerated students. Employment is key to maintaining stable housing, meeting basic needs, caring for family, and more, more than likely, it is a condition for probation, parole, or housing. The students we spoke with elevated the difficulty with being a parent, finding stable work, and finding enough work to meet financial obligations. Next slide, please. Support services are crucial to college retention, 
but are inconsistent across campuses. And in some instances, the responsibility to create a space for formerly incarcerated students falls on the students themselves. There are so many steps a student must take before they can, before they even step foot on a campus. That is many of, that's why many of our focus group participants suggested that higher education support begins before release while incarcerated. Students urge that support take the form of advising and help with transcripts, registration, financial aid, housing, mental health services, and legal support. As an example of the type of support students need while incarcerated, several students reference their lack of knowledge about selective service registration, conditions for financial aid requiring men between the ages of 18 to 25 to sign up for selective service. Next slide, please. Campus advisors lack the knowledge and understanding to properly advise students with criminal records or, career, or on career opportunities. Due to their arrest and conviction history, formerly incarcerated students need expert and often legal guidance as they map out their careers aspirations. Even after receiving their degree, formerly incarcerated students are not guaranteed employment, especially if their chosen career requires a licensure, certification, or clearance. There are more than 50 occupational licensing boards and bureaus in California tasked with grantee licensure certifications to more than 200 professions. Existing licensing barriers impact formerly incarcerated students' choices in academic majors and career fields. And too often, academic advisors are unaware of those barriers. In closing, I wanna thank, thank you once again to all the focus group participants who were willing to be open and honest about their post-incarceration journey. I am in awe and inspired by the real opportunity we have as a state to create change for generations of Californians caught in an unjust criminal justice system. For far too long, California has overinvested in prisons to solve, our, to solve our social issues, but has provided minimal resources or funding to colleges and universities to offer an alternative to incarceration. It is time to change that. And I am living proof that that investment works. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you so much, Danny. Uh, we really appreciate you sharing that important information, helping to shine a light uh, for all of us on the work that still needs to be done uh, to make sure that we properly support all of our rising scholars. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you also to the Campaign for College Opportunity. Thank you for your partnership and your fierce advocacy on behalf of students. We rely on you and so many other partners in this work including the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges and the Foundation for California Community Colleges. We could not do this work without your partnership. We are also grateful for the support of the Balmer Group, Bank of America, ECMC Foundation, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and Mickelson 20MM. Thank you for your commitment to our students and our colleges. And most of all, we want to thank our students. Uh, our students who are with us today, Nohi Alani, Isaac, and Tabiti, but also all of our rising scholars. Thank you for working so hard and thank you for letting our colleges serve you. If you are a student or prospective student or you're simply interested in learning more about this important work, please go to the Rising Scholars website, which you'll see displayed in front of you now, the rising scholars network.org or send us an email to the email you see now on the screen. The website has a directory of all of the community colleges in the network so you can find one that is close to you and we welcome all questions and we welcome all students. Want to give a special thank you uh, to all of the team in the background that has helped to put this together, uh, team members within the chancellor's office as well as the foundation. Thank you all for your work in organizing this today. It was our pleasure to have you everyone. Thank you for taking out time uh, to join us today in this very important launch of the Rising Scholars Network. Please be in touch and we look forward to seeing you again. Have a great Friday, everyone.